Welcome back. The Temple Mount is the site of the first and second Jewish temples. But for hundreds of years, it's been occupied by Muslim shrines. The Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Golden Dome of the Rock now sit on the site. But some Jewish people want to build a third Jewish temple. CBN correspondent Julie Stahl spoke with expert Liz Healy about that vision and its challenges. Liz Healy, welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. Thank you, it's good to be here. Yeah, and we're here on the Mount of Olives with lots of tourists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're overlooking the Temple Mount mm -hmm. with the Golden Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. What's the significance of the Temple Mount to Muslims? Um, for Muslims, it's the third holiest site in their religion. Um, uh, but interestingly enough, it's not the Dome of the Rock, which is the most prominent site. It's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. What's the significance of the Temple Mount to the Jewish people? In Jewish tradition, this is where um, Adam was created. It was also the place after the flood that Noah um, brought an offering to the Lord. We know that this is the place where Abraham brought Isaac to be sacrificed. Also the place where David bought the threshing floor where he said he wouldn't make an offering to God that cost him nothing. And it's the site of the first and second temples. It was believed by most also the place for the third temple where it will be built. It's such a holy site to so many people. Why is it so controversial? I think that's the, that's the exact purpose, because it's so holy. And um, all the monotheistic religions, Christian, Jews, and Muslims, all feel like this is their place of worship. And so it's very controversial of who's going to actually end up on this mound. Do you think the three religions could share the, the Temple Mount? Um, personally, I don't, but there is a huge movement about coexisting on the Temple Mount. And, and even recently, within the last two weeks, I know of a, a meeting between Christians and Muslims and Jews who all are talking about um, what are the possibilities and, and how could they establish both a temple and a mosque um, on the Temple Mount. What kind of plans are being made to, to build a third temple? There are actually quite a few, and um, depending on the group that you talk to, um, different architectural designs have been made. So one group is doing a design more like Herod's Temple, and it would be on the Temple Mount, and I don't believe that they would have uh, a mosque that, that would be there. Um, there are other groups that are more um, focused on the design that's given in Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48, which is the next stru structure in Scripture that God said to build the temple in this way. And then even some archaeological re research has been done recently that would say that the, the Holy of Holies is not under the Dome of the Rock, which is the most common assumption, but a little bit to the north. And that's why the kind of the coexist movement is moving forward is because it's possible that they could be right next to each other on the Temple Mount. Where in the Bible does it talk about building a temple, a third temple? Um, there's several references and um, somewhat depends on interpretation, but we would begin in the book of Daniel where it talks about the um, abomination of desolation. And we know that's happened once, but it talks of a future time where the sacrifices will again be taken away. So a temple would have to exist for the sacrifices to be done. Um, we also see it listed in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 in 2 Thessalonians that all make a reference to um, a false messiah setting himself up in a temple and declaring himself as God or removing the sacrifices. We also see in the book of Revelation, um, John is told to measure the temple measurements and so there has to be a physical temple for him to be able to measure it. So what preparations are actually being made um, right now to build the, the third temple? There are actually quite a few and it just um, shows that God is giving the Jewish people of signs or an expectation that it's time for the soon coming Messiah. But um, there is a group specifically that has uh, re-established the Levitical priesthood. They just started a school uh, a few months ago and they have a registry for those who are from the Levitical line um, that they could come and be trained and be ready to do the service in the temple. Um, they've also started a red heifer farm. Um, the Temple Institute did with an Israeli farmer and that was again with ritual purity that they they need to have a, a, a red heifer that meets uh, Jewish law and has been supervised and doesn't have any white hairs. It's completely red heifer to be able to be burned, mixed with white er, running water, and then um, used to make everybody ritually pure to be able to go into the temple. I mean, right now, I've, Jewish people just going on the Temple Mount can create a riot sometimes. So can you envision a scenario where, where they would allow the temple to be built? Um, 
No. Um, a lot of the um, scholars that I've spoken to uh, talk about how the building of this next temple is really going to bring peace to Israel and to bring safety from all her, her enemies. And so in that way, I can see that um, any maybe leader that would be raised up or somebody that would be able to bring the nations together, especially those who might align with Israel, that there might be some agreement that, that, that the temple could exist there and this person could be set up in the temple. What we know is that's probably going to be a false messiah, because as we read in the book of Daniel, that there's a false messiah that's going to uh, make a peace agreement. And so that's the, the potential, is that something would be built for the false messiah to set himself up. Okay. We are in the final days. I believe you're going to hear more talk about the, 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 the great uh, uh, temple being built in yeah. Israel. Do you ever, do you believe that at all? I, I didn't ask you well, ahead of time, so maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, and there's a push for that. And did you notice that one of the very first things when Trump was elected, the, uh, the rabbis in Israel calling on him and Putin to use their international clout to do what? To rebuild the temple. Don't think this can't happen. I think impetus is on our side right now. I think we're moving towards mm -hmm. a moment. And the rabbis over there, some of what the mystical rabbis are saying is very, very curious right now. Mm -hmm. What are, can I, wow. can, we, can we find out right well, now? Will we just go? Yeah, yeah, yeah go. I wanna know. They, well, I know my audience. They, yeah. <laughs> so look, I, and there's so many of these articles. We've been running them at Skywatch TV almost every week right now. Uh, and so I only brought a couple of them with me. This one, Trump upset victory divinely sent to begin messianic pro uh, process, say Israeli rabbis, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and this one, ancient secret of Daniel 70 weeks predicts end of days will come this year in 5777, which started in October last month in the Jewish calendar year and will be done by September of the coming year. So. Uh, and that, and by the way, that was Rabbi uh, uh, Mir Horowitz 300 years ago, working on Daniel's uh, time, time, and half a time, and he wow. set a date. He set a date 300 years ago. He said, this will all happen. The Messiah will arrive. The end times will begin in the Jewish calendar year 5777. The rabbis have held that dear to them since then. What, what is that? That's 2016 to 2017. Messiah will arrive. Now they're looking at Donald Trump. One of the rabbis illustrated how his name in the gematria, the numerology of his name actually means Messiah. Now, there's some weird stuff here that's going on. So, so think about this for a moment. In the Jewish Zohar, 700 years ago in medieval Aramaic, Orthodox Jews speculated about when will the Messiah be on the earth, right? And in the Vieira section of the Zohar, they said he will, he will arrive on earth in the year 57, he will make himself known in the year 5773, which was 2012 to 2013. Oddly enough, Trump goes to Israel in 2012, decides not to run for U.S. president, meets with heads of states, comes out of that, you can watch the, the YouTube on, on television, and he starts talking to the Jewish people, telling them to vote for Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party, which they did, right? Mm -hmm. wow. the, but what the Zohar said was, he will, he will be identified. From that day and forward, there have been at least a dozen Jewish rabbis that have said, the Messiah is on earth now, he's been identified, he is soon going to make himself known. Well, some, some key things have to happen for the messianic figure in, Jewish, in the Jewish mindset. For the Messiah to arrive, you can't think of him like we think of Messiah. We think of Messiah after the model of Jesus. He's the son of God, divine birth, all of that. That's not the way the Jews look at the Messiah. They're looking for a king. They're looking for a political leader. As a matter of fact, Messiah to them means the anointed one, and it goes back to the ancient days when they would anoint a king and recognize him as this is the man that God sent. And what they're looking for is several things. First of all, they're looking for uh, somebody in, in a political figure 
who can lead decisive battles in defense of Israel. This is why the only wow. po politician Ooh. on the face of the earth that was standing up and saying, if I'm elected president, I'm going to be the biggest friend that Israel's ever had. Yeah, yeah. We're going to undo the Iran yeah. deal, well, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and being a friend of Benjamin Netanyahu. Secondly, they're looking for when the Messiah comes, uh, there will be an ingathering of Jews from around the world back into the Holy Land. That's why the rabbis, on the eve of his election, went on television and said, we need to call now Jews from around the world, come back to Jerusalem because the wow. Messiah is here, right? Yes. Uh, uh, there, there's another thing. Thirdly, they talk about when he arrives, he is going to reinstitute the temple service. So what was the second thing they did? They called on Trump and Putin to use their power to rebuild the temple wow. and to reinstitute the temple service. I'm not saying that they think he is the Messiah. What I actually think is that most of the rabbis there think he's John the Baptist and the Messiah is about to appear. He's the <laughs> forerunner. He's the guy that's going to start the message in the wilderness and the Messiah wow. is going to come in on his heels. And so we need the temple service. We need to get back into Israel, the Messiah. Now, why are they saying that? They have identified somebody. I mean, I there could be a few rabbis there that think he's the Messiah. The other third key is he has to be of the Davidic dynasty. He has to be of the Davidic bloodline. And there is an effort right now to go back through the European monarchy, cousins of uh, President Donald Trump, to show that his bloodline goes back to the Davidic dynasty. Now, why are these uh, efforts underway? I'm just saying there's something very strange here that's going on, and everything I'm saying can be verified. Multiple news agencies, the Jerusalem Post, Breaking Israel News, they're all talking about this right now. Wow. So they too believe that we are in the end times. They too believe that the Messiah is about to appear. We would say the second coming is about to happen, but their Messiah is going to be a false Messiah. He's going to be the Antichrist, right? So I think that the smart ones in Israel are looking at him right now. They're saying he is God's, what we would call John the Baptist. He is God's messenger. When he takes over in January, there is a 5777 countdown to the appearance of the Messiah. And something could happen overnight that could lead to the reconstruction of the temple. Now they're back uh, for round two here, and they're promoting Rabbi Mendel Kesson, who has this to say about Donald Trump. He's going to really be a tremendous president of the United States. Tremendous. Really equality, prosperity, and peace with law and order. He's going to stand up to all the nations of the world. He's going to side with Israel when he realizes that they cannot make peace with Israel, as I've said before, because it's theologically impossible all the ideas I gave in the previous Shurim and so on. That's the Tahar of America. You now, un what it, you now understand what it is, okay? Specifically what it is. See? And that's why I believe, remember I said, that the Gematria of Donald Trump is Gematria Mashiach Ben David? You know what that means? Do you know what that means, that his name is a Gematria? Of course, that means he's Mashiach but David, let's forget that, right? That, that's out. You don't realize something. Somebody who will turn a nation completely diametrically opposite is a Messiah. For them, yes. He, I believe, is the Mashiach of Edom. Isn't that interesting? Because think about it, what does the Mashiach do, right? He turns a nation, basically that's going awry, I mean it's, it's collapsing with the evil and the immorality, he turns it around. That's a Messiah, especially if it's incredibly significant. Wow. <laughs> Donald Trump is a Messiah. Donald Trump, you know, he's theologically, you know, he, he, it's all a plan. He's been put here. And he turns a nation around. That's what he does. In the port city of Bremerhaven on Germany's North Sea coast, a 
approximately 4,000 American troops and 2,500 vehicles began arriving in early January. Known as the Iron Brigade, they're from the Army's 3rd Armored Brigade Combat Team of the 4th Infantry Division, based in Fort Carson, Colorado. This is the largest deployment of U.S. forces in Europe since the end of the Cold War, 25 years ago. It's part of the European Reassurance Initiative and Operation Atlantic Resolve, a $3.5 billion effort paid for by the United States to reinforce NATO. I'm very proud that we're a member of NATO, and I'm proud of our commitment. At the start of the deployment, Army Major General Tim McGuire joked, by rushing to meet the deadline set by the Obama administration, his units weren't able to change their vehicle camouflage. To get them here as scheduled in January, just uh, do not have time to, uh, to paint them green. <laughs> but the Army is anxious to deliver a serious message to demonstrate to allies and adversaries alike, the U.S. is determined to assist NATO in defending Eastern Europe from potential aggression from Russia. The combat power here is a tangible sign of, of the continued commitment of the United States of America. It, it is one that enables us to work with our allies and send a message uh, that we uh, remain committed. You've got tanks here. Brigade Commander Colonel Christopher Norrie describes his unit as lethal. We're an armor brigade combat team. Uh, so as part of that team, we have tanks, uh, Bradleys, we have indirect fire systems, Paladins. We have a whole range of vehicles uh, that make up our, our team here. You can see now you've got one ship here. One ship there, both offloading all of our equipment in preparation uh, for onward movement. Nori's troops spent the past year training for this mission. What's up? Iron Strong! Algernon Lewis and Thomas Rodriguez are Army mechanics. This is my first time in Europe. Pretty excited to be here. Kind of miss home, but it's also nice to be over here helping out our NATO allies. These soldiers concede outside of their families, few folks back home may know about their assignment. Probably not. Probably not, honestly. I, I don't think they do. I don't think a lot of them know what NATO actually does. Under NATO, the U.S., Canada, and 26 other nations pledge to defend each other in case of attack. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea from Ukraine, which is not a NATO member. But that sent jitters across Europe, especially in the five NATO countries bordering Russian territory, Poland, Norway, and the former Soviet republics of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. After international sanctions were imposed on Russia, then-President Obama pledged to beef up American military presence in Europe, which had shrunk from its Cold War level, over 300,000 troops, to 120,000 in 2000, and 65,000 in 2015. Six days after arriving in Germany, Colonel Norrie's military convoy reached the first of those nervous states, Poland, where U.S. troops will begin the first of their nine-month rotations planned for the next seven years. This is the first large-scale continuous presence of U.S. troops in Poland. This army video shows the symbolic moment a Polish flag was added to the lead U.S. vehicle. Colonel Nori was officially welcomed by Polish Major General Jarosław Mika. It is important for security, not only for Poland, for Europe, and for all the world. Why should the U.S. care about what's happening so far away here in Poland? Common cooperation, common swining, and all these things provide more security for all countries. You have to be prepared for a war, yeah? While Operation Atlantic Resolve might reassure leaders in Eastern Europe, it is angering Russia, which has repeatedly denounced the buildup along its borders as a provocation that demands countermeasures. We consider this a threat to us, a Kremlin spokesman said as the troops arrived. The Russian military has been conducting military exercises of its own, and last October, near the borders of Poland and Lithuania, Russia placed missiles that could be armed with nuclear warheads and reached the German capital of Berlin. Russia has called this buildup a provocation. 
Is this a provocation? We are here to deter. Um, and a part of that deterrence is putting this formation together as part of a really exceptionally strong team of teams. Uh, I would view it as a deterrent. Uh, and if I was looking at it through the lens of a potential aggressor, I would say it's an exceptionally capable deterrent. Russia has even recently uh, aligned missiles that are capable of, of being mounted with nuclear warheads along the border. What are you doing to prepare for that? Yeah, sir, we've trained for every eventuality. I mean, we, and, and the, the soldiers that we have in this formation, uh, the capability by battalion here uh, throughout the brigade, uh, they're ready for the full range of any kind of a threat. And our commitment to our allies is very, very important. Right now, we're continuing to build combat power here in Western Poland to rapidly mass our formation and then demonstrate that we're ready to fight. No, oh, they have to start a coup with victims, bloody events, a civil war, terrifying the population in the southeast of Ukraine and in Crimea. And all for what? In my opinion, this is being done to justify the existence of NATO, an external enemy is needed an external threat. Otherwise, what is the purpose of NATO? Armata tank may become remote controlled. Both Russia and China have recently successfully tested their hypersonic gliders capable of breaching the American HAD system terminal high altitude area defense. An air droppable missile defense complex is being developed for Russia's airborne forces to ensure that after landing troops have the means to secure the skies and prevent inbound airstrikes. This system will be the first operating version of its kind in the world. Russia's all new Buyan M missile corvette may be small but the weapons it carries on board really boggle the mind. The servicemen of the Independent Rocket Artillery Brigade of Russia's Northern Fleet have received Bastion NATO reporting name SSC-5 Mobile Coastal Defense Missile Systems Bomb Proof. Russian Terminator Girl tests the next generation personal armor. The next generation protective suit she was testing was developed by Central Research Institute of Precision Machine Building for Russian Ar Armed Forces. More than 20 new types of robots are being developed in Russia that will someday be put to use in life-threatening situations on the battlefield. This is Russia's latest combat helicopter with a flight speed 450 plus kilometers per hour. When Belgium is giving to its citizens radiation protection pills, we have Putin forming a national guard in Russia that will take orders only from Putin. In a sweeping reorganization of Russia's internal security apparatus, President Vladimir Putin has announced the creation of the new National Guard in Russia, a powerful new paramilitary unit charged with combating terrorism and organized crime and maintaining social order. Why did the president decide to create this new military unit now? The National Guard's personnel could be used on orders by the Russian president in operations aimed at maintaining or restoring global peace and security. It is very strange when we have Putin stating that he is not going to leave his position without fight like Yan Yanukovych, president of Ukraine, did. 
he just left his position without a fight. I called Donald Trump a bright personality, and there's no doubt about how bright a personality he is. Trump said he wants to restore full-fledged relations with Russia. What's bad about that? All of us welcome it, don't you? In any case, we'll work with any president elected by the American people. However, the Americans keep lecturing others on democracy, but are their own elections really that democratic? There were two cases when a U.S. president was elected by a majority of delegates who represented a minority of the population. Is that democracy? According to this website, the billionaire who is warning us about an MP attack on America, according to him, Illuminati is worshipping a different god than most of us. When a major conflict between world's superpowers is about to begin, we have Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill signing some documents. What are they signing there? A new religion for us? When the World War III will be finished? A large-scale war should be averted at all costs. A new clash of world powers should be prevented at all costs. Russian Orthodox Pat Patriarch Kirill said in an exclusive interview, stressing that both Russia and the US must do everything possible to improve relations and to prevent World War III at any cost. Patriarch Kirill warned that a confrontation between two major powers with immense destructive force have the potential to devastate the whole world. We have Patriarch Kirill going to Antarctica, blessing the water and land. He said, I quote, When I blessed water in the Antarctic today, I thought about the whole earth that is below us, and I prayed for God's creation. Russia has 10 research stations in the Antarctic. There are about 30 nations who operate permanent research stations in Antarctica, including the United States, Russia, Australia, Britain, France, and Argentina. Has the U.S. been affected by the sanctions? No, they couldn't care less about them. It's Europe that's been affected. And Americans tell their European partners that they have to tolerate them for a while. But why do they have to tolerate them? I don't understand. Well, if that's what they want, then let it be. But why? Maybe Matteo can explain that to you. NATO is undertaking the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense in decades. We agreed to enhance our forward presence in the east and part of the alliance. NATO relations towards Russia remain close and unfriendly. In stronger words, we have reached the level of a new Cold War. And Mr. Stoltenberg highlighted that. Sometimes I wonder whether we live in 2016 or 1962. The financial cost of war in Syria exceeded $200 billion. This price does not include the cost of Russian military spending. It only includes the economic damage and the damage to infrastructure that exceeds $200 billion due to bombing the country. In my view, World War III in Syria was about to start when there was 350,000 soldiers 20,000 tanks, 2,450 warplanes, and 460 military helicopters were participating in military exercise in Saudi Arabia called Northern Thunder. Then, out of the Sudan, Putin ordered the Russian army to start Syria pullout. It was always that World War III was about to start, but Putin has changed the military strategy. And Illuminati did not like Putin to act in a such a strategic way. 
preventing the beginning of, of World War III in Syria. Illuminati's plans for starting World War III in Syria clearly failed, period. The U.S. atomic bombing of Hiroshima nearly destroyed the entire city. A second nuclear attack three days later on Nagasaki in southern Japan killed 70,000 more. Many of the survivors have suffered cancer and other radiation-induced illnesses or have remained unmarried and childless over concerns of birth defects. I order to act in the toughest way. All parties threatening the Russian forces and our infrastructure on the ground are to be destroyed immediately. All right, look at the guy to port. Look at the left one. He is on the deck. On the deck, below the bridge wing. Over the bow, right turn, over the bow. Looks like you may come across the uh, flight deck. Coming in low, bridge wing level. Swing level. Below the bridge wing. Below the bridge wing. С праздником, с днем великой победы. Ура!